that this is this is a, a, a shop from a Jedi. Yeah, a speeder yeah, yeah. bike, and these are the stairs up here. This is this is this this yeah, sounds exactly the signal. same room. Yeah, so I, yeah. I again. Is this the very first soundstage, the first stage at Island? Uh, oh, absolutely. It, absolutely. It was the, we didn't even have a soundstage first, you know. Everything was done across the, oh, like 75 feet across there. And um, I think we were remembering it was like the early 80s or something like this when this was built. It just became, it, it was an empty field uh, from the model shop was that direction. From this direction, it was an empty field all the way to Bellum. No way. Yeah. And uh, you know, a scene that was done there was the Wampa's head kind of roaring up uh, above uh, Luke in the snow cave. Oh, the, against the sky shot. And that was the sky shot was with nothing was out that direction. No building, no nothing. Just. Uh, skies and hills and all that stuff. So but, over the years, you have spent countless hours in here on model shoots. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I, I was thinking about that just a minute ago and I thought, God, it's, it was 40 some years that uh, we used this, uh, the facility and actually 50, almost 50 years from the beginning in 75. Incredible. It's like, uh, who would have ever thought, huh? Yeah. Well, and we're standing on a, a, a removable pit, which Sean was just telling us that they used in Rise of Skywalker. But you were saying that that pit might have been used for uh, Temple of Doom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, in, for Temple of Doom, one of the biggest sets, um, miniature sets uh, uh, that we ever did was uh, Mustafar. Yeah. And I think it's like maybe three quarters of a tennis court, something like that, inside this room. And so there were pumps for lava, you know, which was actually methicil. Yeah. And the pumps kind of came in and we dug, the pit was an area in which it came down and they had pumps, big pumps there to pump the to stuff up. To recirculate and it's and all then, underlit. And people to shovel uh, the crust, you know, like <laughs> there were hidden people going, no, 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 shoveling uh, a burnt cork, a black burnt cork. And it was it was the the biggest production you ever, ever saw. Uh, you're reminding me of hearing about the first camera test. I remember one of the modelers telling me about uh, Ghostbusters 2, uh -huh. where the, the slime had to make a right-hand turn. Oh, and yeah. They, the model shop had built a right-hand turn and put slime in it, and the first thing it did was went right over the corner <laughs> and all over the ground. <laughs> Yeah, methicil is that, it's like a food additive. Yeah. It's like a weird food additive. You know, one of the things, back to Temple of Doom, uh, it, it, they, at that time, they used a, a type of cracker for the smoke, because the thing had to be smoky right, all the right. time, which was um, mineral oil. Like a little, oh, okay, okay. The mineral oil, so you could scrape your forehead with your fingers like this at night after you finished, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, and you'd have this, you know, just oil everywhere. And lo and behold, everybody found out they were really regular. <laughs> <laughs> from, it's a natural diuretic. From hours and hours worth of uh, being in these smoke-filled rooms. I, and But the thing is, is like I every time we fire up a smoke machine on the channel, I say, smoke machines smell like work to me. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like there's that transition. Because I know right outside that door is a big sunny parking lot. And yeah. like... I've had good motion control shoots and bad motion control yeah. shoots, but you walk through that door and it's like an airlock. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like everything everything shifts. Yeah. You must have had some surpassingly difficult shoots on this stage. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a Temple of Doom was, um, uh, this, this, here's the story that it went, is that from George, we were supposedly, we, we had a mandate to not, to make films for his friends, which meant uh, Matthew Robbins and, and Spielberg, uh, as because uh, we were making the goose, the, we were making the eggs that the goose laid, the golden eggs. <laughs> uh, they were the you know two hundred million dollar films, yeah, a profit. And uh, so when uh, Temple of Doom came along, Spielberg comes along, and he proposes this thing, and, and Dennis and everybody is like, oh my God, you know, the optical, you had to get everything through the funnel of optical. Everything that happened here had to go through uh, optical. You mean the department that does the that does all the, the final, final compositing and color yeah. matching for the... So they could only work at a certain speed, night and day, night and day, you right, know. Right. And uh, so um, we were not supposed to say no. So, uh, so it wasn't I, like it was a profitable business necessarily. You yeah, were just not supposed to say no to George's friends. Not supposed to friends. say no to his friends. And so uh, Dennis and I said, it has to be like a miniature live action model shoot. 
And that's why so much of uh, the Temple of Doom was like big water tanks and, you know, uh, giant lava pits and all that kind You're of stuff. You're going back to like the origins of cinema. Yeah. Yeah. It was like having to be a miniature version of live action. So you have also, I don't think I've ever asked you about this directly, but I know I've heard it from you in a couple of stories. You've sat at many times with most of these directors listening to ideas and yeah. pitching back solutions that yeah. model that, that, that the model shop yeah. could execute. I'm curious about people like Spielberg. Like, what did you find intellectually talking with him about this? It's well, uh, he's a fun guy, no yeah. matter what. Really? He's just, he, uh, there was one day here on Poltergeist and uh, we had this the big esophagus, which we called it. It was the, that wall that the kids were sucked into yeah, and everything yeah. like that. And Paul Houston had made a, uh, he operated it because of various vacuum pumps. And he had a keyboard. He made a keyboard, like a little miniature kid's keyboard. And you, you played it like this, and it caused the undulation. Oh, and, the bladders to fill. Yeah, the bladders the, to right, fill right. and suck out and everything like that. And Spielberg's here, and he goes, we operated it for him. And he says, How's that happening? What's happening? You know, so oh, I he said, needed to know the secret. Yeah, and said, I said, well, let's come around behind and I'll show you. And, and it was like a little piano, you know. And he says, I want to do that, you know. And so he's like, dun, 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 you know, having a good time. And he he has a good time. But another story about him, or you, the original question about how you know sitting around tables with directors yeah, yeah. and that kind of thing. So uh, for Poltergeist. Uh, it was a table with, uh, you know, Phil and Dennis and Richard and uh, Spielberg and various people. And uh, what we did was we went through all this, every storyboard. Spielberg would turn the storyboard, storyboard and then he'd point to uh, Richard uh, mm -hmm. or Dennis, you know, and then uh, yes. what about uh, this? Or Richard in this case. And what about Phil? And um, so you needed to come up with an answer that was like, you know, he didn't want a, a paragraphs and paragraphs of an right, answer. Right. So it came to the imploding house, and I had had a little bit of time to look at the storyboard ahead of time. So he says, Lauren, this looks like model. How are you going to do this? And I said, well, it's a bit like, um, you know how a mag magician gets a, a f group of flowers out of a wand, you know, boom, like that. We'll just make the flowers go back into the wand. He says, okay, next page. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's got to be a tremendous amount of pressure because you're, yeah. you're saying something that will commit hundreds right. of people to years right. of work. Right, it's it's uh, it's both dangerous and exciting and exhilarating and <laughs> and all that stuff. You know, the the danger part of it almost makes it more exhilarating. <laughs> Fair enough. You know? And what you're talking about is it's one of my favorite effects in film, yeah. the house. So yeah. you, you actually did that. You did drag the house yeah. through a tiny. Yeah, through, uh, well, it, it was a funnel. It was actually the, the whole, uh, there was a giant vacuum tank and it led to a hole about 10 inches in diameter. So yeah. everything had to go into the hole in 10 inches in diameter. But it was then a big funnel. It was like, uh, you know, all the little uh, 5,000 steel wires connected to all the little pieces of balsa wood that yeah. had been weakened and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, um, yeah, but it was a big deal. And we did it, we did it once. And it worked once. Oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> and, One and done. But they asked me, uh, they said, well, can we do it again? And I said, well, yes, you can, but there's nothing that can be saved. It'll cost just as much as it did before. And Two at X. the time, it was more like if you did everything, the shooting and everything, it was like a an inexpensive house way out in the suburbs. <laughs> you know, so they said, nah, we're yeah. not doing it again. Yeah. Uh, when you when you revisit the old movies from that time, do you sometimes are you watching a scene and you're, you're called back to this stage in your memory? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't that often go through sure, the old, fair old enough, films. Fair enough. I've already seen them. You yeah. know, how many times you, uh, can you but see I, it? But I, I imagine that there might be, I mean, there must have been things that were happening. I, I, my favorite view is always backstage. Right. Yeah. And so oftentimes I'll watch a movie that I worked on and I'll think, oh, if anyone could just see yeah. what it looked like when we were doing it, it was yeah. even cooler. Yeah. And it is, it's, it, what a lot of it was documented, but not as much as it could have been. Yeah. You know, because it's like you don't, when you're making history, you don't know that you're making history. Of course, right. <laughs> and it's, of course, it's kind of out of your mind. You have a lot of other things to think about. Um, but, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's, endlessly fascinating you know and yeah, I, uh and I, I mean we ended up shooting mythbusters jr in this space and mm. get no so i have like two whole families worth of associations with, yeah. the, with the building yeah 
You know, I'm, I'm, uh, we were looking at one of the airplanes from Always yeah. um, in the other room. One of my all-time favorites. And, um, you know, we originally did those as giant radio control models. That they were, yeah, they were, they were actually what, flyable. Yeah, they were flyable. And they had chainsaw motors. And um, in in the in the engine, oh, <laughs> that's chainsaw motors running. <laughs> the chainsaw pops. motors, and um, they flew. They made these clouds, faux clouds, like a PT boat type of smoker. Right. Uh, they left over from World War II, uh, which is a whole other story. But but anyway, uh, it disappeared into a cloud, and then all of a sudden, it dawns on everybody that the chainsaw motors could take people's heads off the propellers if if they went the wrong direction yeah. or they crashed into people or something like. That. So then we did it on wires. We, we switched to wires. <laughs> Do you, I, I, I seem to remember, was there a plane crashing into a runway that you guys did where the plane you made was so accurate it flew and you had to actually use a wire to drag it into the runway? I don't remember that. I, I it, was on, remember uh, it was on, I think, Die Hard uh, that they went out to the desert uh, in the wintertime. Is it this one? Ah. Uh, it's this one. Yeah. From Die Hard. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Sean, come over here. This is the plane that I was mentioning. This is, this a, is from Die Hard. Yes. So can you tell me about that story? So, Well, th there's a whole bunch of stories from Die Hard. <laughs> um, this, this is actually the second model that was done of the DC-8. Okay. Uh, the first one, w when they were at the runway and the winds were kicking up and they, all the planes apparently were Lifting trying to trying to lift off mm. the ground and everything. And so they pulled this uh, the explosive the one filled with explosives and from what i understand is the pyrotechnicians um got a little bit aggressive <laughs> sure as they are wont <laughs> to do the yeah. reason that they had built this one was because they knew they had to do this whole sequence uh in two different takes but as i said they got a little bit of aggressive and so as this one hit the runway the nose split off and it's just roiling uh, the flame and the nose spins off and comes straight at camera and yeah. they got the shot yeah in one take amazing and you were saying uh, off camera that the holes in the walls are actual explosive debris evidence this is this is from decades of explosions going off in here yeah these, these are all holes caused by debris from the explosions there was one time a was he a young intern probably is what he was and he he was here and he was just rhapsodizing i was giving me a tour he's rhapsodizing about this this has happened and i said yeah all the you know x-wings and tie fighters are all exploded here and all parts went everywhere and he said, oh, God, what I would give for a little part, you know, something from one of those ships. And I said, well, do you have, we have five minutes, right? So there was Dubatine walls at various places. And I just went around to all the corners with a <gasps> flashlight with him. And we collected, you know, little, uh, the, the blue, the stormy sea blue parts from the uh, TIE no! fighter and, <laughs> yeah, and all that stuff. And he came up with like a little little bundle of little small three-quarter inch size pieces. So wow. back in 2000, Galoob hired me to shoot some photos of Star Wars toys in Star Wars sets. Uh -huh. And I did a pod race Galoob toy and I reached out to you. I called you up and uh -huh. I was like, Lauren, do you have any extra Moss Aspa sand? And you were like, uh -huh. I might be able to <laughs> find a bit. And literally yesterday I found this in my storage space. You gave me a gallon bucket of uh -huh. Moss Espa sand, and it's to Adam Moss Espa Savage. <laughs> no wow. oh, so awesome. your generosity clearly yeah. wow. encompasses. Yeah. You know, we used to, um, when, the, um, when the sand set out in, you know, Yuma, I think it was like that. Kind of, yeah. I had them send me a, I had to have a sample. Say, what's the color of it? Right. So then I measured the size of the sand and I had to come up, I wanted to come up with a sand that was a smaller scale, which is, is possible. You know, wow. you, you can have, you can have sand that's an eighth of inch of the size of sand. And then we had big cement mixtures and then we just kept mixing uh, tempera. Uh, throwing it in the thing until wow. we mixed the color and we got the color of the sand wow. and just static electricity or something would hold the the um, the, the pigment the, the pigment onto the sand. Incredible. But, and uh, you, you brought up Galoob. The um, in Return of the Jedi, there was deep background uh, Tie fighters that were actually white and black that were the toys that yeah. were the Galoob toys. Yeah. Yeah, they, there was a whole bunch of them flitting around in the back. Yeah, we'd, we would force perspective that way, you yeah. know. It's like it didn't matter if, you know, a ship in the background was actually on a piece of glass with a photograph if it was far enough away.
Well, so now here's a question I have because it never occurred to me to ask you this, but like when I am clipping through model trees for little greeblies and good looking uh -huh. parts, I prefer really my favorite is the uh, the the rail gun, the railway gun. Oh yeah, right. That just has the yeah. most, the highest number of parts I love. And we called it. It was Anzio Andy. Yes. And then the Morse uh, Carl. Uh, Car, uh, the Carl. Carl. And I love yeah. the Flakvierling. Mm. That's yeah. also. Yeah. But I'm curious. Since you were part of the team going out to the first, to picking up the first model kits for your yeah. guys' model yeah, library, Steve what were I. some of your early favorite models to clip from? Well, I, it was always, um, uh, Tamiya was yeah. the top of the list. Hasegawa yep. was just, you know, both of those Japanese companies that did uh, World War II uh, uh, tanks and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But Anzio Annie had to have been, I used it all <laughs> the time. But also a um, Hawker Harrier. We all know that uh, it's kind of a, it almost looks like a, a baby's arm, uh, you know, with uh, mechanical things. It's, uh, it was a Hucker Harry, was that airplane that could lift off, right, off the ground. And so it had these deflectors for air yeah, and everything yeah. like that. And the back of the uh, sand crawler is these major uh, parts, you know, in the pack. And I use them all the time. One of my favorite things when I was working here is like we would be like moving around through the break room and I'd be talking about something I'd paint and right. like, Lauren or Steve would be like, right, when I painted the sand crawler. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That, and didn't the, um, uh, wasn't it the, uh, the rail car that also gave uh, what they, uh, the, what Universal Universal the Universal Greeley. Universal yeah. Greeley, yeah. Well, yeah. We, well, we put that on one of the sets for Space Cowboys, and then we got to see the, and I'm sure you saw this a million yeah. times, how the live action set guys took your Greeblies and made them this oh, big. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so yeah. there's, a, there's a, from the set of Space Cowboys, there are Universal yeah. Greeblies this long. You know, on um, it was on uh, Empire that um, we were the model shop was supposed to make the Probot. You know, we were about this diameter or something mm -hmm. like that, and uh, we had a lot of other things to do. And Gary Kurtz kept coming to me and saying, "You know, if you don't, we have to have that thing done." You know, like, could you, could you, could you? And, and I'm like, and you were running the model shop, yeah, yeah. And there were a lot of things to do. And finally, he said, "Lauren." You have to. We have to make that, or I'm going to have the live action crew make it, and then you'll have to copy it. And that was like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that would be awful. You know, he knew exactly how to get what he needed. Ooh, yeah, it would be awful, awful. We we spent day and Paul Houston and I spent day and night to get that probot done so we could ship it to England so they could produce it in in full size. Wow. This is the uh, the the black one with the yeah, legs. the big black one with the legs because it. You know, a non-model maker, you'd imagine, for us, we could just take Greeblies and put them on and you make this composition. To, the other way around, we would have to look at it and get the measurements of all the little parts and everything like scratch. that. And then just yeah. carve them all by hand. Oh. It's like, oh, lordy. Replication is a grueling slog. Grueling, yeah. Oh. It's a lot of measurements and, and uh, you know, calculations and to get the thing right. Yeah, you know, we were, we've been talking about explosions in this space, but... The explosion shoots were the rarity. The much more common shoots in here were like the motion control shoots, yeah. right? And I think that most people don't realize just how crushingly boring those can be. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, but there was a lot of great conversations in yes. the dark. Yes, <laughs> yes, you know? totally. I, I, that an Apple box was your friend, yeah. you know, and especially the model maker's job, you know, we didn't run the cameras, we just tended to mm -hmm. the whatever the model is being shot. And I can remember conversations with uh, Brad Jarrell and things like that in the dark, mm -hmm. you know, like just a tiny, tiny bit of light and just running through our lives and thoughts and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, so, the camera's <laughs> clicking through yeah, the positions. Yeah. Moving very, it's, very slowly. It's almost <laughs> like you, it's like you're, you, forced isn't the right word, but in our regular lives, we're not often in that kind of a position, you know, just not having to really have other things to do, nothing visual to distract you. And to well, you bring up an interesting thing about the culture. And when I first got here, I, I was, I was really, it was such a lovely community because we'd all be listening to the same radio on the way into work. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'd all chat about the stories of the day. And yeah. when I watched Light and Magic, one of the things that became clear to me was that it really seems like when the move happened from LA up here, that the selection process really seemed to prioritize a community oh, yeah. uh, of like-minded individuals. Ooh. And when I, when I watched it, I had this flash, oh yeah, this is the community I met 20 years after yeah. that. Somebody, when uh, when I first got up here, uh, 
somebody recommended me uh, a, a kind of a management book by John DeLarian, the guy with the car. Yeah. And uh, I didn't read the whole thing, but I read the highlights in here and there. And one of the things he said was, says, if you, you have people of equal uh, talent, or even if not necessarily equal talent, a little bit off here and there, always choose the one that you can work the best with. And even if you have somebody who is just incredibly talented, yeah. if you can't work with him, he, he's a he's a superstar. He you know is a, a queen, yeah. a king. Uh, d- reject it. And I've I've had to. I mean, wouldn't you shouldn't do it this these days? But I actually had calls that somebody I interviewed was the perfect model maker, and people two people called up and said I worked with him for years. He's a grandstander. He won't work with other people. It's like his his steel. Yeah. And I went, hmm, yeah, that's that's what I was warned about. Yeah. And one of the things that like like you were part of when it's so collaborative and no ego when we would be sculpting. And every 10 minutes, you swap positions with yeah, the, you know, with the, and do the uh, sculpting yeah. in the round. Mm-hmm. That way, um, you'd be changing what somebody else did potentially. Yeah. And so there was no, uh, that was what was amazing yeah. about it. There was no ego about that. No, and no, everybody no. pitched in and created these beautiful things yeah. together. On the, on the white starters, the big white starters, for her, we did that. And I can actually see... Uh, like Steve Golly's style of scribing can be a little bit different, and so that's why I had them rotate. But it's it's interesting what you say is that it, you could you could almost write a book about it because you say with no ego because there is egos at ILM, and sure. it's just it's but they're they're got a definitely a sense of being collaborative, you know. But uh, every once in a while the daggers come out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hill you find you there have is. to die. Yeah, I. I uh, I, I had to tell uh, a model maker that was kind of like crestfallen about something. And I said, everybody has a dagger, you know, and sometimes it comes out. Uh, somebody that's once true. told me that everything that's great about your company is also going to have a shadow side. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the trick is to realize that you can't change the shadow, you, but you need to know about it. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're right. The model shop is full of a lot of healthy egos of yeah. people who were incredibly good at what they yeah. did. But that collaborative thing where someone could walk in and be like, no, nah, that part's wrong. And you'd be like, yeah, they're totally right. Yeah. <laughs> but what I remember specifically was first getting, I was working on early on, I was working on uh, Space Cowboys and I was doing this, um, this radar dish bowl and you came by and uh-huh. you were like, what are you doing? Because I was uh, I was vac- oh. I was laser cutting and then slump vacuum oh, forming. Oh, that was fantastic! And you were like, I haven't seen that before. And <laughs> yeah. we talked about it. And you were telling me about movies you'd worked on with solutions. And then by the end of the day, everyone in the shop filed past my desk because you were going around being like, "You gotta go look at this new thing. <laughs> you, you gotta see it. You gotta see it. It's got to become part of our toolkit." Yes, right, right. And yeah. That was really lovely. Right? Yeah. It wasn't like I had been in shops where people were like, "I don't want you to." Yeah. yeah. I had one modeler on a job. He was doing a technique that I admired. And I was writing down the technique, and I said, will you tell me about your technique? And he said, no. Ooh, and I was like, really? I blanched, and he went, I know, isn't that weird? And I was like, it is a little weird. Yeah, it is a little weird. And I, he said, I think of it as my employment, and I don't want anyone else to know this yeah, thing. Yeah. And I'm like, I think you're yeah. fundamentally making a mistake, but sure, go with it. Yeah. yeah. It's like that, it was, it was the, it's not a zero-sub game. It's not a zero-sub right. game, no! It grows and it grows and it grows and it grows, you know, and that kind of a thing. I love your story uh, from, I think it was Star Wars itself, when you were introducing the cyanacrylic glue to everybody. Dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. You, no, the, you built all of Star Wars with epoxy. Yeah, yeah. With, oh, with five-minute epoxy. Here's the story. I was, I was hired... <laughs> with a guy named John Erlin, my partner, we had a small company, for two weeks. It was either two weeks or two months to solve a problem on the Death Star, a, a grisly problem. Well, w- w- about two days into it, I kept noticing the other guys, the model makers, because they were slightly two separate rooms. Yeah. And um, they were taking five, taking the parts, five-minute epoxy, and putting tape onto the model, then they go to the next one, and, next, and then the the epoxy would be too hot. You know, they have to mix more and over and over again. And I went, "Wow, that's unbelievable!" <laughs> but um, I had this guy named John, and I had had our own company, and you could buy Eastman 910 uh, industrially. You couldn't buy it. No, there was no shelf that you could buy it on in a store. A cyanoacrylate. Cyanoacrylate yeah. glue. So I brought in a bottle, and I said. Uh, uh, in the morning, he says, model, you know, everybody here, 
the five or six model makers. I want to show you something. And I took a pencil, Dixon Ticonderoga number <laughs> two, and uh, and held it three quarters of the way out on the edge of a table, and I put a drop, like, and I moved my hands, and the, of course it remained cantilevered, and it was like, it changed the speed in the world of, of model making. brought fire to the natives. Yeah, <laughs> fire to the natives, right. Yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. But it, it was like all of a sudden it changed the speed with which we could do things oh, yeah. incredibly. I, if there's one material I would consider critical for a model shop, it's literally yeah. CA glue. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like if I can, I can give up almost everything else. I can make a hammer out of CA glue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, and, and the discovering baking soda with uh, super glue. It's so structural. Yeah. 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 It's just you can really make things strong. Lauren, but it, it can flick you in the eye, you know? <laughs> it can ruin your glasses. I read a story, because we always used to talk about this, because one of the great conversations around a model table is um, worst case scenarios. Yeah. Right? We love trading. What is the worst possible way to die? All those kind of conversations. Yeah. And I, we've always talked about, God, could you imagine if you accidentally oh. thought your C. Aglu was eye drops? It oh. happened to somebody. It happened to me. It happened to you? Yes. What? No. About two or maybe two or three times. I mean, I've, I worked here for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't wear glasses, yeah. and not even reading glasses. And I was working uh, late at night uh, by myself one time, and the little, little, yeah, the thin, the, the little Teflon thing flicked and, and got me in the eye. I thought, ah. So I, I had to uh, call Paul Houston, who lived a couple of miles away, oh and said, Paul, I got to go to the hospital, you know, and all this stuff. And he, he came by and took me to the hospital. And they, um, what they do is they have to kind of pry it and have stainless steel tools and, and get it off. Ooh, but they, your eyeballs. They, they have this liquid that they give you, that a numbing liquid. Yeah. And they don't tell you what you know what it is. It's a, you know, Bob, they have a name and said, now I know what this is. <laughs> it's it's a little bit of cocaine, right, medical right. quality cocaine is what it is. And so you lay there and you, it's like they're going boom, you boom, you boom, like hitting a beach ball. And you're kind of like, I don't care. <laughs> 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 but but it hurts. Novel. Like when the, it wears off, it's like, you know, having to tear the. You feel super the, raw. Yeah, you feel really raw and you have a big patch on your eye. You're real, real annoyed. I'm all the glad time. you're still with us and no, yeah. your eyes are functioning. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, Quick story involving that plane there. Yeah. So you were talking about worst case scenarios. Yeah. Well, you know the, the tricks everybody played on each other. This was down at ILM in the city at LDAC. Yeah. And it was directly over Gene Bolte's desk. Yeah. Huh. And Howie Weed one time went and he put a post-it note on a tape measure and got it up there. Right, she walks into work, looks up, and the post-it note says, "What could possibly go wrong?" <laughs> and it stayed there the entire time she was there. That's a good prank. I like that. Uh, yeah, I yeah, yeah, really yeah. appreciate you guys talking me through some of the stories yeah, here. It's it is uh, an amazing space. Yeah, there there are incredible stories of uh, like John Goodson and um, Howie Weed. Oh. Uh, one time in the news, there was a thing about whether or not. Um, screens were emitting uh, radiation yeah, and all yeah. that stuff. And uh, it was when uh, uh, Apple watches, you know, and they had one, the balance thing, you know, there's this balance and the, uh, little, oh, right. Uh, right. Yeah. the little noise. And so Howie comes in and he tells John, he says, did you see that thing in the news last night? What about the thing? And he says, he says, yeah, let's, let's I don't know, let's give it a try. And he said, let, let me, I'm going to reach around behind where it'd probably be more intense. And he goes, and pulls his hand back. And John is like, oh, what was that? Yeah, I think it, I think it was radioactive, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> but he's using his watch to, to make noise, you know. And, oh, and uh, John uh, is like, bought it for like, Two seconds, yeah, the, you know. The, the one I liked was taking a piece of mylar and cutting it into the shape of an exacto blade and putting it in an exacto knife. And then, as you're talking to someone, just doing that. Uh, and the 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 it was you got some different responses because I remember going like this and being like just talking and then doing this. And J.P. Gittinger, R.I.P. J.P. Gittinger, yeah. his one was fucker. Like that was his autonomic response. But Michael Steffi was all like whoop. Whoop, you couldn't get Michael Steffi. Like, he just did, he turned into a ninja when a blade was around. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, the, God, anch there's... the anchovies, uh, when uh, they were doing the, um, oh, uh, the, the special edition, 
and they were refilming some of the Hoth sequences with the Wampa and Howie. Oh, Howie played the Wampa, yeah. wound up getting into the Wampa suit. And uh, it had, you know, the full air cooler system in it and everything like that because it was so hot. And I think they were filming it during the summer, too. Yeah. And uh, apparently Howie had pranked John uh, by putting something bad smelling somewhere. So John went in the night before and put anchovies in the cooler (laughs) system. But he didn't know this because... (laughs) <laughs> and what happened was is that he put George is on set and they put the helmet on him and all of a sudden he has the worst smell and oh. he couldn't do anything about it because George was there. Amazing. <laughs> well, you know, one time uh, I ended a, a session like this with uh, when I was a little kid, teen, a kid, there was a show called The Naked City. Yeah. On, um, yeah. And the way that they ended it in black and white, they would in an industrial section, they look over New York City and all that stuff. And he would say, uh, there's a three million stories in the big city, and this was just one of them. Mm-hmm. And it, it's true of ILM. There's yeah. millions of stories, uh, and it, these are all just one of them. Yeah. But, um, and also, it's like, um, it says something about our uh, inclination to play, you know, yeah. that, that model makers, uh, especially in this environment, uh, you were encouraged to create and, and play. There, you really were. There, yeah. It really was like a collaborative play environment because that's yeah. where all the best ideas come from. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And the exchange of idea and a germ of an idea can become a monster of an idea in an afternoon by just <laughs> getting it into the mix and uh, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. It feels so elegiac, but it is literally elegiac. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, sure. I appreciate yeah. it. Cheers. Thank you.